we're talking about our media episode. Last week we had a, on the Apple TV Plus program, we had an episode on the media. Mm -hmm. Now, Brenda obviously has great experience there. She was the, uh, if I don't, may I say, she produced the news for CBS. Yeah, I did uh, for six years six, at CBS. Six years. And then 12 years at ABC News. So I've been I've been doing this for almost 20 years, and now I'm here. And mm -hmm. this episode was, uh, it was personal, man. It was personal. It was personal. We, I, had to, we had to work through some, some, some feelings. <laughs> Tears. When, when we started it, it, it began with, John, you're being very hard on, on, on the media. And it ended with, let's get these motherfuckers. We will destroy them. I believe we them. sang a song from Les Mis at the end. <laughs> do you hear the people sing? No, nah, we That's do. That's what we did. We, we do hear them sing. Henrik, were you, you, you were never involved in news. You were a comedy writer pretty much from the get-go, right? You're not. That's, uh, that's true in a professional sense, but mm. I went to school for journalism. I went to, uh, I went I to Michigan State that. for journalism and I did, what? uh, I worked in newsrooms covering, like we would cover small towns around East Lansing. You know, mm -hmm. I was I was writing for the uh, the Mason Times and the Williamston Gazette, and I did an internship at the CBS affiliate in Kalamazoo, where I'm from, mm -hmm. uh, which was extremely eye opening uh, because it was full of it was a microcosm of what we talk about in the episode, which is it was a lot of really great journalists that got into the field for really noble reasons, mm -hmm. wanted to tell great stories that would. Uh, inform their community and help people make important decisions for their families. And because of the uh, it bleeds it leads, we got to be first nature. They did a lot of having to knock on doors of people whose kids just got murdered and having to kill important stories about tax policy or health care in favor of something that uh, the corporate office sent down about uh, we got to say Obama's bad. Brenda, is that a microcosm? So I would not have expected that on a local level, to be quite honest with you. I would have thought there'd be less cynicism and a little bit more engagement. But is that a microcosm of national media in your experience producing at ABC and CBS? You, you know, John, it's something that we talked about when we were making this episode, which is mm -hmm. I still firmly believe that journalists don't get involved because of clicks and ratings. I mean, they get involved because they want to do good work and they want to report on things that um, mm -hmm. Im impact society in some way and they want to call out bullshit. Um, I, there's not a ton of money in it. I mean, once you become on air, it's a little different, but it's not like, you, you know, if you want to make money, you go into a different profession. You don't, you don't become a journalist. Um, I, what, what I think this episode helped me really clarify and be really open about is that the things that I got into it for mm -hmm. were not the things that I feel like I ultimately ended up really committing to in a big way by the time I left, because by the time I left, I was kind of moving up the ladder in a management way. Mm -hmm. And by then success was really being defined by ratings and, um, and, it felt like there were stories that I personally killed because I didn't think they were going to rate well. So I fully was a part of a system that right. engaged in that kind of behavior. I'm not somebody here to just throw stones, you know. Um, and uh, but but uh, one of the things I remember you saying as well, uh, you know, as th this whole Ukraine thing is happening, is that you were. Um, pretty impressed and continue to be impressed by the kind of journalism you're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about whether you sort of still feel that way? Or are you noticing any kind of shift take place right now in coverage about Ukraine? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I think any time the story, so what happens, I think, especially with the 24 hour cable networks is they find their narratives. And then, so when the invasion first occurred, it was an all hands on deck, 24 hour uh, eyewitness, uh, the, the bravery was incredible. They lost the entire right-left polarity of coverage. Punditry went out the window. It was just about uh, brave people on the ground and uh, those who were expert in conflict in the studio. And they would have conversations about what was actually happening. But it doesn't take long for mission creep to set in with journalists who then become the what's like, this is a siege. And a siege is by its very nature static. And the carnage is unspeakable. But it is the same. And journalists 
want movement. They want action. And as you're watching, you know, I, I looked at that, uh, I think the intercept, uh, sent something out. It was the white house correspondents that are all like, would you bomb them if they touched Poland? Uh, how about this? Would you bomb them if they had a drone? Okay. Okay. Uh, let, let, let's look at it this way. What would it take for you to bomb them? How about bombing them? You know, we have a question for you. Bombs. What about those? And they're like, all wearing zoot suits and holding big cigars. Yeah, it's <laughs> but it's you start to see narrative creep. Mm -hmm. It's no longer about like this is what's happening. There's still some of that, but you see the story start to move on into speculation. What would happen? What right. would it take for this? It, what if Putin got killed? What if we killed Putin? What if we went in and poisoned? Uh, you know, and that's the part where you realize they're trapped in a business model that creates news as narratives. As mm -hmm. It's one thing to tell stories. It's another thing to direct them and to start to try and shape them. And that's what I'm starting to see uh, as in what we're seeing now. Would you, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, we were talking about that same thing this morning, uh, which is that I think, you know, we talked a lot in the episode and you've mentioned a lot of how you don't think the, the media has a liberal bias. You think it has a bias towards sensationalism and escalation and conflict. Escalation, and, yeah. And, and I think sometimes that is, instead of, that is a symptom, not the cause. I think oftentimes that is a symptom of a gravitational pull to narrative, which is very understandable. That, that's exactly we right. We try to do the same thing on our show. You know, it's the way that human beings digest and categorize information is through narrative. But sometimes things don't so easily fall into a narrative. And I think with this, we're seeing um, that those questions, I don't think the journalists are sitting in the White House press corps like, please, please, a big war. Like, I don't think they as individuals want a big war. Right. But I think the gravitational pull towards a narrative arc, towards movement in towards the narrative more conflict. Is, is what drives that. But, but here's the thing that's fucked up in my mind. There ain't a lot of questions about peace. Right. There ain't a lot of questions about what would it take to de-escalate this situation? And how I could we possibly exactly right. uh, do that? It's all about the action. And I disagree mm -hmm. slightly with the idea that they're dispassionate because I'll tell you, underneath it all, they know this is where careers are made. They know that, that there's a opportunity here to really uh, lift their profiles. And I hate to say that in a cynical way, but I think that's absolutely what occurs. I think... One of the things I've noticed is, like, war reporters are some of the most passionate um, uh, kinds of people out there. When when they go out there, they their their stories. And by the way, some of the fucking craziest. Oh like, my gosh! I'm not saying everybody, but fearless. Some of the war reporters I've met, I'm like, you're out of your fucking mind. Right. But they are the ones, you know, whose stories, when there's not a conflict, their stories are the first ones to go. Their stories are the first ones to get killed because no one cares about foreign news. But the truth is, so I'm going to give you a snapshot just from today, right? Because okay. you're talking about Mariupol, and is that how you say it? Mariupol? Um, right now, CNN, okay? Mm -hmm. Russia bombards Mariupol, hundreds of thousands trapped, massive font. It's basically their entire above the fold. Same mm -hmm. thing with the New York Times. It's entirely about Mariupol, thousands trapped, which is a big story. Mm -hmm. And like, absolutely, we should learn about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing that I'm struggling with when I look at a CNN website today, right? Mm -hmm. At the top, you have two children are in critical condition. You have a man who survived four Nazi concentration camps is killed in a Russian strike. Right. That those are the leading stories. And those are both stories of individual suffering, which absolutely, I think, like on some level should be told. But that's what's leading the site. The other thing I'm observing is that there's like 25 headlines that are on CNN right now. And with Mariupol is like Sean Mendez and Camila Cabello break up. What? And and Pete when did Davidson that happen? Has been replaced on the Blue Origin flight. We like, were gonna wait until after to tell John. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what I'm saying? It's it's as a as a human, I am struggling to sift through all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that you and Bob Iger talked about in the in that interview, which I thought 
I, I agree with him on is this whole thing about volume. There is so much responsibility placed on me as a human, as a consumer, to sift through stuff. And I got to hand it to the Washington Post. I'm not just saying this because Margaret Sullivan's on the call. All right. I really think they're doing a nice job today. <laughs> well, listen, Where, to be perfectly frank, print media in general, because television is a passive experience. So if you were to watch the 24-hour news networks, your vision and version of what's important in the world would be very different than if you were to hold that up next to a newspaper because a newspaper is not myopic. A, new, a newspaper will emphasize certain stories, but there's breadth. There's breadth, there's depth, there's width. A newspaper provides you a wide array of important stories with uh, caveats. I'm not saying it's perfect, but for some reason, the 24 hour networks are like a distillation of that. So you don't get any of the other flavors. It's just pure, it's fucking meth, methamphetamine. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, I hate to put this in breaking bad terms, but here's what, here's what happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, the newspapers create a great amount of stories and then the networks take that into a bathtub in a small ramshackle shack in the outskirts of Mesa, Arizona, and they bubble it down and they put in some lunch and they create crack and meth and, and that's, and that's what they're doing. Don't try this at home.